joining us or? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. So I'm starting the, the webinar. Hi everyone, I'm Stefania from Birchain. We are giving five more minutes for everyone to join. Thank you.
So welcome everybody to the first session of Blockchain News Conference 2021. Uh, we are very happy to have you all uh, joining us today. Uh, my name is Stefania and I'm Birchian Association Manager and I'm your, your host today. And today's event, Blockchain News Conference SSI track, is actually kicking off proudly uh, the second edition of Blockchain News after last year's first edition. Um, in fact, this year, uh, Birchain teamed up once more uh, with Berlin Partner for Business and Technology to bring you Blockchain News uh, Conference 2021, um, starting actually today um, uh, until December 3rd. Um, so each day uh, we will have um, a daily session uh, every day from uh, 4 until 5.30 uh, until this Friday, as mentioned, uh, exploring real world blockchain uh, in use cases and um, across five different verticals. Uh, today we will start with SSI and tomorrow we will continue with DeFi. And uh, Wednesday, 1st December, we are going to have um, an episode on NFTs. Uh, Thursday, uh, December 2nd, uh, we are going to have a session on blockchain integration in the public sector. Uh, and Friday, December 3rd, uh, on sustainability and blockchain. Um, today's event um, is actually focusing on uh, SSIs and we'll be tackling uh, several prominent use cases in the world of self-sovereign identities, uh, followed by a panel discussion with a set of selected experts. Um, the session will be uh, recorded and will be available on our Virgin YouTube channel. And I will be also posting a few useful links um, uh, along the way. Um, now, um, I will like to uh, guide you through the agenda for today. So I will just share my screen. Sorry. The emotions of the life. <laughs> All right, so basically, um, we'll start um, with an introduction uh, and welcome uh, from CEO Stefan Franzke. Uh, Stefan Franzke is actually the CEO of Berlin Partner for Economy and, and, um, and Technology, so Business and Technology, sorry. And we'll continue with a keynote uh, from Jose Manuel Penizo, Innovation Project Manager from Fabrica Nacional de Moneda y Timbre. And we'll start also a use case round uh, with um, uh, at 4.30 with uh, Jonas Schneider, uh, IT consultant uh, at Esatus and ID Union. And um, we will continue with um, another use case presentation from Irene Fernandez, uh, sorry, Hernandez, founder and CEO of Gataka. And um, last use case will be actually Irene Adamski, head of operations of Yo uh, at Yolocom. And afterward, we will have a panel discussion starting at 5 um, and lasting until 5.35. And we will actually take um, five more minutes, uh, like no, including five minutes for Q&A, actually. And um, in the panel discussion will be uh, present uh, speaking um, Irene uh, Adamski and Jonas Schneider and Jose Manuel Panizzo and Hiran Hernandez, and, um, and as well will be moderated by Kai Wagner, a member of the board of directors at INATPA and also coach at the Identity Group. Uh, Kai is also covering um, actually a role for public affairs at Yolocom, but today will be representing INATPA since we already have um, a representative from Yolocom and this is actually Erin Adamski. And, um, so basically, um, I would like also to welcome all the speakers and thank you for being here. And I also would like to close with uh, a few uh, words about the um, organizers before handing the word to Stefan. 
Um, actually about us, Birdchain, uh, we are a nonprofit member-led association based in Berlin. And our goal is actually to promote and connect the local Berlin blockchain ecosystem. And for those interested, I will be pasting a few links um, uh, also to know more about our activities. And uh, a few words about Berlin Partner uh, for Business and Technology. Uh, actually, they support companies, investor, investors, and scientific institutions in Berlin. And they have uh, many experts uh, providing an outstanding range of programs to help companies launch, innovate, and expand uh, the, the, and secure also the, the economic future in Berlin. So now, actually, uh, to also know more about this, I will hand the floor to Stefan Franzke for the keynote. Thank you for listening and being here, and let the session start. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Stefania, for the nice introduction and a warm welcome to all of you to the first day of the conference Blockchain in News. I'm very proud that I uh, can address the welcome note uh, to you. and. After the last year's success, we are organizing the conference again with um, our partner, Birdchain, um, and we appreciate the close cooperation with the blockchain community here in Berlin. With the establishment of the Blockchain in Use Conference, we promote the important discourse about the current trends and innovations on an international level. As the title already makes clear, at the conference, we show the numerous blockchain use cases from practice and discuss the opportunities and challenges of implementing innovations together with the international experts. And um, we are really proud that uh, Berlin is the blockchain capital of Germany. Um, nowadays, we have currently 120 blockchain startups, incubators, accelerators, investors, and research institutions. And uh, Berlin has one of the most active and development, developed blockchain ecosystem worldwide. Um, the startup heat map, I hope you know the startup heat maps survey in uh, 2021. They published that Berlin has replaced London as the startup location in Europe. The task now is to maintain and expand these rank. And Berlin is successfully competing with other, other global hotspots for young cryptocurrencies companies. And you're all welcome here in Berlin because our goal is to maintain the title of global blockchain capital. In order to continue to keep up with the likes of Chicago, Silicon Valley, and Switzerland, company must be supported in putting their innovations into practice. This is what Berlin Partners as your partner does uh, with the support of the Senate Department for Economic Affairs, Energy, and Operations. And uh, we are the central point of contact for the blockchain companies in Berlin and those who want to come to the capital. But we are not only support companies in implementing their innovative business ideas in the capital region, but also contribute our expertise to research projects as associated partners such as ID Union. And the goal of the project ID Union is to build an open ecosystem for decentralized identity management that can be used worldwide and is based on European values and regulations. Everyone will be able to manage their own identity information and decide when and with whom they want to share it. And if this sounds attractive, interesting to you, please contact us for further discussion. And now I will hand over to Jose and uh, to his keynote. Thank you very much and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Stefan. Stefania, you can share my slides, please. Yeah. OK, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jose Manuel Panizo, convener of the European Cell Sovereign Identity Framework and also Spanish representative in the EPSI Technical Group. Happy to be here and also happy to share our insights in EPSI. 
I'm going to be speaking today about the path to a new European digital identity based on a decentralized foundation and the current state of play in FCSIF. Next slide, please. If you can put it in full screen mode, is it possible? Uh, can you see it now in full screen? Not yet. Because I'm actually seeing it in full. Uh, but no worries, okay. It's almost full. Okay, so this is a, okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, it, okay. It is clear that a change from scratch is needed in the ecosystem of the European digital identity. And not only because I'm saying that, we have the political mandate from President von der Leyen to create a secure European digital identity where the users can control which data is exchanged and how it is used. Therefore, the European Commission has recognized the importance of the digital ID. Next slide, please. You can see the current ecosystem of the European digital identity is fragmented into a set of credentials issued by different public and private sector players, stored in different physical cards of digital wallets, and not interoperable and difficult to check the validity of if the user is in the is the relevant source in one member state. Next slide, please. First, we are, we are going to have a journey through the different challenges of the current technical and business approach. Next slide, please. It's a global approach in identity, which is completely opposite to our aim in Europe. There is a global, there is a global and commercial exploitation of data where users don't have the control of personal data. Other nations follow a nation-centric approach where all data is collected with any concept of the user. And this is also a training approach. For example, biometric data collected while you are traveling. Next slide. The information is stored in different silos following the traditional data sharing approach. The ability to share information among organization and member state is achieved connecting them in a complex and cumbersome way. And it doesn't work in a big scale. We also add to the equation the link between public and private sector. And you finally end with an spaghetti, which is neither interoperable nor scalable. Even more. If you need to arrange the splitting consent of the user as it requires in GDPR, the model is still more complex. Next slide, please. Other challenge is the requirement to perform a selective disclosure of the attributes that are electronic attested in a credential. For example, when a worker has to share a payroll to confirm the relationship with a company, but he or she doesn't want to disclose his or her salary. Next slide. Other challenge, ah, sorry, we are in the, can you come back to the challenge four? Um, other challenge is how to build a trust chain outside of the own business domain, cross-sector, or even cross-border. For example, how a Spanish company can find out which are the valid university to issue a diploma credential in Poland. Next slide. European digital identity ecosystem, we also face the challenge of dealing with multiple identities, for example, a Polish citizen will temporarily have a German identity while he or she is working in Germany. How to manage this? Next slide. And we have new challenges in the table. For example, there is a reality that we cannot hide anymore. Trust in government and in government system is slowly declining. Citizens are not trusting in government as this happened some years ago. Next slide. As a result of all this, the user is in the middle of a maze, trap, and he or she doesn't have a clear and profitable exit from this maze. Right? Okay, uh, so in this moment, do you think that there is any alternative to this? Next slide. So we consider that the alternative is just this, putting the user in the center of the table, the center of the play. Next slide. In 2016, Christopher Allen outlined the path that brought us to the concept of decentralized self sovereign identity, describing his famous 10 principles, which has been complemented by the United, by the United Nations, adding the principle of inclusion, where all the citizens have the right to have a digital identity. Slide, please. So from all these points, the European Commission started the EPSI initiative. 
slide. To begin, it's important to mention the alliance that initiated this project. This is the European Blockchain Partnership, also known as EVP. Slide. The EVP was formed three years ago by representatives of 29 countries and the European Commission. They joined forces in a commitment to working together to leverage blockchain by means of building a blockchain network supported by member states, which is EPSI, and creating, using this technology, cross-border services for public administration and their ecosystem. The aim is to provide trustworthy services to benefit the whole European Union. Next slide, please. So we can see here, this is the current state of the EPSI network, 38 nodes that have been deployed across Europe, currently in more than 21 countries, all of them hosted by public institutions. Every two weeks, new releases are rolled out with new improvements and corrections. Next slide, please. So EPSI supports the creation of cross-border services, such as helping citizens and business to manage their own identity, educational credentials, and also to notarize documents. These use cases aims at facilitating mobility of citizens, as well as quarantine, the verifying, and the authenticity of digital information in different sectors. They represent huge market opportunities, as well as being in line with the major priorities of the European Union and also the European values. Each of these use cases draws input from dedicated user groups of member state experts. Additionally, a technical group of member state experts provides input to the definition of the infrastructure layer, and the EVP policy group makes key political decisions. Next slide. In 2020, the first release of EPSI was launched. The EVP members, national administration, and interest public authority could start testing EPSI and deploy nodes. A number of demo webinars have been conducted, which generated a lot of interest from the public and private sector. Slide, please. In this slide, we can describe the added value of, of, sorry, of SIF as a framework which leverages SSI with a role of market player, but also with a key role for government. The starting point is the issuer verifiable holder SSI model which anchors and verify information in EPSI network. Upon this, the added value of EPSI appears in the involvement of government services and information as a link of decentralized identity with EIDAS and GDPR, as a secure trust anchor for issuers and credentials, and also as a way to simplify public services and to access to public information cross-border and cross-sector. Next slide, please. Today, FC is a multi-layer solution which includes a semantic layer, a verifiable credential profile, a decentralized API, a set of smart contracts, and of course, a blockchain network, and follows the principles of being user-centric, the individual is at the center of the data exchange, decentralized to ensure security and scalability, in a reusable approach in many contexts and use cases, and interoperable based on open standard to stimulate interoperability and create cross-border public services. As you can see, every use case has the same reusable roles, issuer, verifier, holder, and accreditation organizations, but they are played by different actors. Next slide, please. Okay, in the Q2 of 2021, the pre-production environment with more capabilities was deployed and it is planned for the Q1 of 2022, the production environment of the network. Next slide, please. So now time to talk about the early adopters program. It is an initiative to establish a collaboration with member states to implement EPSI use cases in co-creation in order to find synergies and to further spark the ecosystem with attractive examples to showcase EPSI version 2 and to accelerate its scale up. In 2021, 22 projects were selected to become part of our incubator program to help delve into the potential of the EFC initiative. Each project, private and public sector partners, was given early access to the pre-production environment of EFC and was invited to develop their own pilot project to address a specific business or government use case involving the exchange of verifiable credentials. 
next slide, please. To support early adopters, FC technical team has provided different tools. First, the verifiable credential profile, which has been built on the WB verifiable credential standard, sorry, specification, the GDPR, and other relevant European regulation. And with that, FC aims to create a generic profile for the full lifecycle of verifiable credentials and presentation for use cases that involve these verifiable credentials. Second, the verifiable credential playbook, which is a document which summarizes the technical standard, specification, and decision that were accepted in order to meet the business requirement of the use cases. And finally, a wallet conformant test to check the functional and interoperability capacities of the wallet. Next slide, please. These are the universities that are currently involved in the multi-university pilot distributed in 22 pilots. Next slide, please. This will be the next steps of the FC initiative. First, to prepare the production environment. Secondly, to launch the recruitment of interoperable digital wallets. And finally, to showcase, communicate, and foster the partnership with the stakeholder and ecosystem. For example, the relevant policy DGs from the European Commission, other initiatives, or other engaged member states. Next step, next slide, please. So in this moment, we can affirm that EPSI is gaining momentum. First, in the showcase, showcase of the multi-university pilot, which is a great experience of interoperability and of providing cross-border pilots. Second, we are working with other European initiatives, for example, the European data format, sorry, sorry the European data format. Third, we are starting to put in place the work of EPSI in the context of the European identity wallet. And last but not the least, riding on the momentum of national initiatives, for example, the member state alliance to promote digital identity. Next slide, please. We have identified that the European digital identity wallet can take advantage and reduce some of the efforts that EPSI has done. For example, this initiative can can be built on the work done by EPSI on the domain verifiable credentials or on engaging with wallet providers. Also can reduce EPSI verifiable credential profile and also take advantage of EPSI trust registries or blockchain network. Slide, please. So thank you very much. And I encourage you to join us connecting millions of European citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, for your presentation. I guess now I'll hand the word to uh, Jonas Schneider. Yes, one moment. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, hello, my name is Jonas Schneider. I'm working for the Isatos AG nearby Frankfurt. I'm a consultant and developer, so I'm programming so software and also consulting our customers. The Isatis AG is part of the ID Union project, and I will give you a short introduction to this project. The ID Union project is founded by the German Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy as part of the, oh, sorry, um, as part of the show, uh, showcase Secure Digital Identity. As Stefan already said, the main goal of the project is to create and promote an open, interoper interoperable, and easy to use identity economy, economy, ecosystem. The project officially started at April 21 and runs until March 24. The cons consortium is led by 15 consortium partners. There are some very well-known companies, for example, Siemens, Bosch, or Telecom, and also the Isatos AG is a consortium partner as well. In addition to that, there are associated partners which are involved in the research topics. Here you can see the current list of the organizations. Overall, we are over 40 organizations and we are still growing. The organizations are a mix of private companies and public authorities. We use a distributed ledger technology and the concept of self-sovereign identity for the solution. 
the solution contains uh, identification, authentication, and authorization of persons, companies, and other things like IoT devices. The identity data is based on individual attributes that can be freely defined and combined with each other. The advantage of this of, of that technology is that the solution is data protection friendly. Most of the parts are, are or will be open source in the future. Overall, the main goal of the solution is to create a widely used open ecosystem. Here you can see some components of the solution. So the big difference to common identity system is that instead of a central authority, the trust is organized via distributed ledger technology, which works as decentralized PKI system. Um, in the middle, you can see the triangle between the issuer, the holder, and the verifier. In SSI, the issuer issues the credentials to the holder, which is saving the credentials at his or, or her wallet. The holder can present the credentials to the verifier, and the verifier can prove with a distributed ledger that the credential is valid. The most important part is that the data are stored in the wallet of the holder, usually on the smartphone, and the distributed ledger does not contain any personal data or information of the person. Yeah, IDU is split it in multiple working groups. Uh, which are researching on some topics or implementing use cases. On the left side, you can see some of the topics we are focusing on, like security or interoperability. On the other side, you can see some of the use cases, like edu education or e-health. In addition to that, we developed a distributed ledger test network, including a governance structure so a company can easily join the network. Here you can see the use cases in detail. There are 35 in process and this number is still growing. Uh, I briefly introduce you to one of these use cases. At the education part, you can see the use case student ID. The student ID <coughs> at the TU Berlin is implementing a student ID for some pilot schools. The goal is that the schools issues the students a credential which can be used for buying a bus or train ticket so they can prove that they are students and get the student discount. This shows a small roadmap for the ID union. This year, the focus was on developing the software for Protect the Fuse and starting implement some prototypes for the use case. Next year, we want to implement some of the use cases and go productive. In addition to that, we want to get better interoperability between different frameworks. Uh, 23, we are aiming to achieve mass adoption and finish all use cases, including the highly re regulated like bank system and EIDs. Finally, I will show you our unique selling points. We are provide an open ecosystem for digital identities. Everyone can participate. The partners among the leading SSI solutions providers, and we have a strong involvement from public authorities. We have already successfully implemented some use cases, and they are software solutions from the partners which can be easily used. So thank you for the attention. Um, here you can see some contact data if you want to get further information. Uh, no, I finished very, very quickly. But I think then we have more time for the discussion at the end. Yes, thank you, Jonas, for your presentation. Um, I would like to hand the word to Irene if she's here. Already? Yeah, hi. Um, hello, everyone. Can you hear me correctly? Yes. Good. OK. Um, let me share my screen very quickly. So um, just to talk very briefly, I'm the Irene Hernandez. I'm the founder of Garaka, which is a company that builds sovereign identity technology. 
Um, just to give you a little bit of background information, um, we have currently a product suite uh, developed that consists of an ID wallet here in the middle uh, for um, end users. Uh, and also we have Caracas Certify, which is a product that uh, is able to issue credentials according to the W3 consortium standards and um, fully compliant with the FC specifications that Jose Manuel was talking about earlier on. And then we have Gataka Connect, which is the product that enables authentication or simple sign-on solutions based on self sovereign identity technology. And I wanted to give you a, this very brief um, overview of the technology suite because I'm, uh, I wanted to here explain two uh, practical use cases we've been working on. Um, the first one is about uh, our involvement in the Spanish uh, use case. Uh, the Spanish government joined the early adopters program at EPSI uh, with the European Commission with the main objective of building what they call the, the Spanish um, EVAS journey, uh, which is the issuance of a verifiable ID and the use of that uh, to issue academic credentials. And you, you, you see here all the organizations involved in the consortium and implementing this uh, specific use case. Now to give you a little bit more information about how this is all organized. Uh, so as part of the European Commission's EPSIS Early Adopters Program, the Ministry of Digitalization in Spain is responsible for uh, the use case. Uh, and within it, there are uh, kind of two, two major sub um, initiatives. One is the issuance of a national or a verifiable ID. Uh, which um, is being led by the Royal Mint of Spain and also the issuance of academic diplomas. Um, and those are currently implemented by three different universities that you can see here, plus Red.es, which is an organization that implements IT services for all Spanish universities uh, nationwide. So we've been uh, implementing with our technology all the end-to-end the -end, um, use case where the Royal Mint of Spain issues a verifiable ID that a student then uses to obtain the academic diploma. Um, and I want to be super practical so that you, you cannot see only screens um, or, or presentations, but also uh, you know tangible results. Um, here with the Royal Mint of Spain for confidentiality purposes, I, I just put some screenshots, but you can see that they already implemented this service um, and they explain what verifiable credentials is all about. And then uh, they require a traditional authentication using one of the uh, EIDAS valid uh, um, identifications currently for, for remote authentication. Um, I'm using my electronic certificate issued by the Royal Mint of Spain to authenticate myself. And this is when I generate or, or the Real Mint of Spain generates a session just for myself to download my verifiable ID in my wallet that you can see on the right hand um, side. So upon scanning that QR code with my wallet, I can obtain my verifiable ID that you can see has, you know, all the information, the minimum information of information defined by EIDAS. Now, once a user has this information, and let me switch to demo mode, um, what we implemented is, uh, here you can see literally my phone uh, with my wallet, what I have here, a bunch of credentials already downloaded and accessing like uh, any login process is really as simple as scanning a QR code with my wallet, authenticating myself with uh, biometrics and voila, I'm inside the student portal. And now you can see how downloading a new credential, say an academic diploma, is really as issue uh, as simple, sorry, as scanning a QR code again with my wallet, consenting to share some information from my wallet, verifying with biometrics, and in literally seconds, I could have in my ID wallet. You can see here the push notification, the credential just appeared here in the upper part. Uh, with who was the issuer of the credential and, and you know, all the claims associated to that academic diploma. I, want, I, I don't want to make the demo um, uh, any longer, but then the demo continues by using this academic certificate to apply to a master's degree. And that is all um, already implemented as the Spanish use case. Now, I also wanted, uh, this is basically, you, you, you also have this, you know, the full demo uh, more explained in detail in, in this, link down here, happy to provide that if anyone has um, uh, curiosity about the full demo. 
Uh, but I also wanted to talk, uh, spend a few minutes to talk about another use case because that use case is super important. Uh, the first one I mean, because it really combines many organizations working together. We're talking about a government using a, a verifiable ID. We're talking about universities, a completely different organization taking advantage of that. So cross industry type of, of use case. But we're talking everything, you know, within a Spanish scenario. What if we're talking about interoperability, which is very important in self-sovereign identity? How do we achieve interoperability in cross-border scenarios? And this cross-border use case is what we're working on with Una Europa, who is a university consortium that has eight universities in Europe, and there they serve over 400,000 students. And we're implementing a cross-border use case using two of their universities, KU Leuven and the University of Bologna. And what they're doing is, okay, we have you know, this wonderful network of European universities with students moving across um, countries uh, to study abroad for a semester whatsoever. Um, and this process is really a nightmare. Let's try to see if some sort of identity could streamline those exchange programs. And what they're building here is a use case in which, in which a student from KU, uh, KU Leuven is applying to an exchange semester at the Universita di Bologna. And they're doing that basically by uh, using a verifiable student ID issued by the uh, KU Leuven and being completely accepted in, in, in literally seconds by the Universita di Bologna. Now, the, they don't stop there. Uh, what they're doing then is, okay, once this student uh, has executed that um, uh, exchange program at the Universita di Bologna, the student needs to bring back all the transcript of records to the uh, KU Leuven University to have a complete transcript for his uh, or her studies. Um, so what we do here as a second step is to literally issue um, um, to e issue a transcript of records by the Universita di Bologna, then then it are verified and accepted by KU Leuven. Um, so that the uh, records issued by one university in another country can be instantly accepted and verified by another university in another country. And this pilot is already um, um, done implemented, as you can see some screenshots of how they implemented this self-service um, attestation, uh, this self-attestation uh, service where they can literally, oops, uh, I, sorry, I took it out. Um, so they can definitely um, basically request for their verifiable student ID using this service and that's downloaded into our wallet. And then that um, student ID is used at the uh, University of Bologna and then uh, the reverse process with the transcript of records. So um, I just want to show you two real use cases of how this is being um, piloted and used in, in different scenarios, uh, cross-sector scenario and cross-border uh, scenarios. Happy to answer any questions and definitely for the discussion panel afterwards. Thank you, Irene, for your presentation. And now I would say uh, I'll hand the word to uh, the other Irene. Irina Damsky, hello, welcome. Hello, Stefania, thank you. Also, yes, it's always lovely to be on a panel with Irene Hernandez. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's informative, and it's also one of the very few situations to have this name twice. Um, let me, in a similar manner, just quickly open up my presentation and then start the screen share. A quick um, reply, can you see the full presentation now? And then I'm happy to start. Yes, indeed, thank you. Thank you. So uh, welcome everyone, thank you for joining us today and thank you to Berlin Partners and Virgin for having Yolocom here on the panel. And today I would like to speak about SSI on the road to adoption, which thankfully is happening quite a bit in Germany. Um, first off, my name is Irene and I work for the company Yolocom. And as soon as the presentation 
goes. Um, this is the first version of our Yellowcom smart wallet and Yellowcom itself is a, is a purpose company. So uh, while we are a private sector company, we also have our own articles of association going for you know, the greater good and um, having a focus on society and not necessarily just profit. We were founded in 2014. We are headquartered here in Berlin and we are currently having a pretty team of 14 people all of which are working on an infrastructure for decentralized digital identities. Um, you have just heard two very lovely presentations and a keynote about what SSI actually is and how it works. Um, we are pursuing the same goals and we are trying to achieve them via open source technology stacks, standard compliance and modular setup for both end users and for service providers. So what are we currently working on? Um, thank you, Jonas, for already uh, introducing the overall showcase. Um, so the German Ministry of Economic Affairs has issued a public tender um, almost two years ago. It's called Secure Digital Identities and they are um, German lighthouse projects. There was a two tier process for the tender targeted at a consortia consisting of both community actors, industry actors and innovation companies. The goal still is and was to provide a variety of interoperable and um, secure digital identity solutions across a very wide range of use cases. Jonas had introduced a few of them and we're happy to introduce a few more. Um, in the end, um, a dozen consortia have applied for the full funding and four were chosen. And for the SSI sector, this was really great because in the end, um, all four chosen consortia, consortia are um, pursuing a form of SSI solution. So this was a big win within Germany. And um, each consortia now is receiving 50 million euros in funding over a span of three years to do the research and development um, in order to provide pilots, which can though very quickly then go into in interoperable production. And um, you've heard of ID Union, which is uh, set in the basically in the Northwest. And we have three others. One is ID Ideal, which is in Saxonia. We have the ONCE Consortia, which is stretched uh, basically from the Northwest to the Southeast. And then we've got SDCA, which is covering quite a large area within Baden-Württemberg, uh, the Southwestern area of Germany. And Yellowcom is technology providers, particularly for the smart wallet within three of them. And then going ahead, what is currently cooking, so to speak, within these consortia and within the Yolocom wallet. And um, what you can see here are the screens, currently the German version, they are also available in English, at least in the testing phase within the consortium, is in, um, basically bringing the German EID card into the smart wallet, which is a new feature. So a quick introduction for those in the audience who don't uh, aren't familiar with the German ID card. So ever since 2010, the German ID card, which you can see down here as an example, um, also has a data set on it um, that can read and uh, basically provide a data set about your identity electronically, digitally, um, to in order to identify, authenticate yourself online. This has been around since 2010, had a couple of hiccups with uh, basically usability and easy access. Um, but the important thing is that it provides a high level of security for identity authentication online, which is in accordance with the EIDAS regulation and the layer levels of assurance. So while for some very easy transactions in the private sector, you need uh, the medium level of assurance, for public um, sector interactions, for example, when I want to certify that I have moved from possibly Cologne to Berlin, then if you wanted to do this digitally, um, it's not um, you would need to identify yourself uh, across authorities. And here things have been yeah, a bit tricky um, for the last 10 years. And here we are hoping within the consortia to provide easy access. And this is currently in piloting phase. So we have integrated the so-called Ausweis app 2, which is um, the state provided app in order to do this process with um, the German ID, uh, ID card into the Yolocom wallet. What's the benefit of this? The, wall, uh, the um, smart wallet Yolocom is providing now allows for interactions with the EID card even though um, the wallet itself doesn't retain it. And this then makes it possible to access and uh, both SSI data and EID data, granting easier access to such regulated use cases, for example, in the health sector, in the mobility sector, or in the public sphere.
happy to answer questions later on, but quickly to go ahead. Um, what are the future goals for the um, uh, smart SSI wallets? Um, here you can see what the rough idea is to make it a little bit more detailed. So we have secure element integration to make uh, yeah, interactions even easier and open the scope for secure interactions and use cases even wider. We are working um, across the consortia and with other standardization bodies for standardized APIs. So that service providers um, have a gain in usability as well. We are of course working to stay in compliance with the EIDAS 2 regulation in order to make sure that everything we are achieving within the consortia can be used EU wide. We are also working on a backup system for SSI data. So um, all the data that you privately are um, establishing within the wallet and feeding into it can be backed up and re-accessed when you need it. And also there's a piloting plan in order to go for the ISO standard compliant MDL, which stands for mobile driver's license. This has a lot of regulatory hurdles where uh, other parts of the consortia are attacking as well, but on the technical side, this is where we are headed. And so uh, to wrap the presentation or to start wrapping the presentation, what does the actual architecture look like? As mentioned in the beginning, the SDI projects as well as Yolocom are very focused on interoperability. And here the overall prof interoperability profile, so to speak, is across three layers. So on the one hand, we've got the application layers where end users are accessing things or service providers are going to be interacting with the technology. Then we have the communication layers where all the SDKs, so software development kits are going to be found and accessed. And then anchoring all of this is the so-called anchoring layer where the trusted data can be accessed and uh, basically verified. What can this look like? So for example, in our case for Yolocom, it would be the Yolocom agent. Um, which is a web agent in development so that service providers can uh, test around their use cases and then also access their use case or provide their use cases to end users. For end users themselves, we've got the Yolocom wallet. You just saw a couple of screens for this. But of course, we are um, it's all open source and it's going to um, for interoperability. So for example, wallets from the ID union system from Spain, we are very much looking forward to that. So get a car can interact with the system and of course other agents as well. The idea is that the Yellowcom SDK 2.0, which is currently in development, will be open source as always, will be W3C compliant and also compatible with the area stack. And of course, the anchoring layer can be is going to be agnostic, but it can be DLT based. It's going to be modular, but it can also go for the PKI layer on storage systems. So if you want to use a blockchain, you should and will be able to. If you are skeptical or have other reasons to go the non-DLT approach, this will be possible as well. And that's the final slide. Or no, almost final slide. Um, the Yolocom uh, is active within the SSI ecosystem, so thanks again for having us here. Um, this is some of the organizations and associations we are active with. So this is basically the SSI community as well as standardization bodies within Germany, within uh, Europe, we have VAE Nutbar and others, and of course others all across the globe working for the SSI course. And now the really final slide, thank you for your patience. Um, this is a rough Yolocom roadmap. Um, so here we are at the end of 2021 and 2022, the first half is going to be the alpha phase to bring the SDK, the agent and the wallet to a new level of yeah, feature support and then using the second half to get ready for production and uh, basically with a stability gaining phase for beta stage testing and then be ready for productive use cases in 2022. As mentioned, blockchain agnostic, no lock-ins because it's open source and we are going for interop and yeah we have no plan um, we are working closely with organizations setting standards but we are trying not to get locked in or um, stalled by them so we currently make plans to go both ways have interim solutions um, until they are ready and when did come to and other standardization bodies are available then we will be happy to move on with those and with that, thank you so much. I think I'm uh, moved maybe a minute or two above the time. Thank you for your patience. Looking forward to the discussion and any questions you might have. Thank you. 
Thank you, Irene, for your presentation and very insightful. And now I would like to uh, quickly introduce the panel um, that we have upcoming. Um, always, uh, I hope you can see uh, my uh, desktop in, in full. Uh, um, so we have actually Irina Adamski joining Jose Manuel Panizzo, Irene Hernandez, Jonas Snyder, and the panel will be moderated by Kai Wagner. And I would like to invite all of them on stage. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Stefania. We are already on stage since we didn't have to walk very far today. Very <laughs> sad. Um, I would actually have hoped that we can make some of this conference in person. So. Um, happy to see all of you here anyways, and also happy to see so many people in the audience um, made it up to 61 people participating in this event now online, which I think is great. Um, yeah, let's get started with the actual panel discussion for our event today. And I think just to kind of come up with a bit of a summary of what we've heard in the last hour, I think it's really interesting that we hear a lot about European developments around self-sovereign identity, and we can really hear that Europe is at the forefront of developing this new technology and not just developing the technology, but really taking care of implementing it, taking care of bringing it into the actual reality of European citizens. And at the same time, we heard from the German project of the SSI Lighthouse projects, or better said, secure identity Lighthouse projects, which, te which tend to be focusing quite a bit on SSI. And I'm personally happy that we have different representatives from this project here as well. Um, also seeing a few people in the audience that can probably chip in questions on this topic. And yeah, just um, maybe to hear a bit about your perspective on my first question today. And that is, we've heard a lot about research. We've heard a lot about things that are currently planned. We hear things that are being piloted. We hear early adopter. Um, but where are we actually? Like, as, as a European citizen, not having been involved with any of this um, and thinking about the title of this conference, Blockchain in Use, where can I use self-sovereign identity today as a European citizen? Or if that's not the case, when can I do it? So first on, I would say Irene from Gattaca. Thanks, Guy. Um... I think in general terms, if we consider mass adoption as having a society available for European citizens, I think we're not there. Obviously, as you mentioned, we were talking about a pilot here, well, plans to put things in, in motion and into production. We're not there yet. And I think the main reason is that we need a legal framework for all of these. We're talking about a single digital identity with which we can do virtually anything in the digital world. And for that purpose, you need to consider regulated industries and regulated industries have to, to comply with regulation, um, especially KYC, this type of you know, strong authentication requirements. So for SSI to be mass adopted, we need that legal framework. And um, uh, in Europe, uh, I, I hopefully don't, um, uh, don't mistake too much, but everyone is looking at this EIDAS version two as that legal, legal framework that will provide legitimacy to SSI. Um, and the, the new specification proposal sets very clear timelines. The, they're saying this has to be approved in under a year by member states, and then member states will have like 12 months to propose this uh, to citizens. So um, I think that the timeline is quite clear. It's just about getting that specification as the legal framework for countries willing to bet on SSI to really move forward to production stage. Yeah, thank you so much. I think you're telling about a really important point with the IDAS 2.0. And I think being honest about where we are as a community and as an industry is very important. And um, we're always kind of switching between building something that is really up to production level. And at the same time, we have to still say to people that they have to wait for a bit longer, they have to wait for a bit longer, just because although the technology is really about to be ready, it's only worthwhile if it's interoperable. We've heard that quite a few times before, right? We want to make sure European citizens can choose between a range of different service providers and wallet providers and things like that. And for that to be the case, you don't just need good standards and interoperability on that level, but you need a, a framework, right? And a framework is what's in the name of ESIF, right? It's the European Self-Sovereign Identity Framework. So Jose Manuel, um, regarding that question, right? Like you're 
you're more of the kind of research project member states and commission driven you're working on the question of how to to set that up technically quite a bit um but where are you on the perspective of seeing a framework right like do you think EIDAS 2.0 is going to be the framework for all of this in Europe okay thank you um regarding the EIDAS working group our colleagues from H4, the European Commission, uh, they have an outstanding work to align two requirements. First, the identity wallet. Uh, we can see the government identity. And also they have an other, other tasks to combine this with a wallet to store the qualified and not qualified attestation of attributes. And apart from this challenge, and regarding your question about the framework, um, this challenge is a great task. But what comes to my mind is the Cybersecurity Act, which reinforced the role of the Agency for, for Cybersecurity, ENISA. Um, this, this act established a cybersecurity certification framework for product and services. And regarding this, I'm expecting how ENISA will develop a certification scheme for the digital wallet and a cybersecurity framework, and how to align this with the Implementing Act 15002 which sets the security requirements for the different level of assurance on a notified ident identification mean. So not only yeah. uh, we have different frameworks, but um, I would like to, to point out this, the importance of the cybersecurity framework. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think what's also pretty telling from your answer is that you said there is existing government EIDs, right? We have, we have had EIDAS regulation since 2014, and we have actually established EID and notified EID across the European Union and several member states. And the new EIDAS proposal, as we see it now, just for those present in the audience not aware of this, it's the European regulation for electronic identity, authentication, and signatures or electronic signatures, qualified electronic seals and the like. And this regulation has been overhauled recently with a proposal coming out in June of this year from the European Commission. And as Irene has already pointed out, this has to be ratified or actually accepted by the member states or is supposed to be accepted by the member states in the next one and a half years. Um, officially, it's really up to the Council and the European Parliament to, to go with that timeline. But right now, everything looks quite like people are going to stick to that timeline. And one of the major challenges here is really to combine this existing EIDAS EID schemes with the new ideas of qualified electronic attestations, which is something that we can very much compare with verifiable credentials, at least from the ideas behind them and the way they're uh, described in the new regulation, right? Um, looking at, at my role as an INAPA representative here as well, we are quite engaged with this particular policy proposal at the moment, and we're in talks with different players in order to really bring that along with the SSI ideas in the next year as well. So handing over to Irina Damsky uh, for a bit of a question of what you're doing in these German projects and, and kind of detailing this out a bit, because now we have luckily all the four current German projects involved and, and even a representative of the company that has been involved in even another German project that is also tackling similar questions on the kind of federal level more recently. And I think what would be interesting is to, to understand a bit more about the German context, right? We're in a Berlin-based conference here, even though we're global and online by, by the setting. Um, but I'd be interested in how you um, would summarize what's going on in these Schaufenster projects or Lighthouse projects right now. So especially in regards to the German EID system as it stands today and what we're bringing in from the SSI side. Okay, thank you. So as mentioned, there are four different projects and I wouldn't presume to talk about ID Union. Looking forward to what Jonas will reply on that. Um, so within the other uh, three projects, it's really as um, presented within the presentation that for the ONES project, we are currently bringing in the or in integrating the outside app to SDK into the Yolocom wallet. So here the idea is as well to have the so-called within German, the EID function to actually make use of your, um, your EID card data set within the interactions uh, and data transactions online to make this easier via using a smart wallet. 
Um, so this is one of the things going on. And then the idea is to have more public use cases, which as mentioned earlier, there's this level of assurance. You need a very high level of assurance in order to be able to interact with government use cases. And this is one of the huge stumbling blocks. So um, for end users, it was the usability um, from 2010 to 2014, you needed an extra card reader in order to make se uh, sense of this or use of this functionality. Of course, we can understand that a lot of citizens were basically foregoing the effort, but especially with the pandemic and other things, it really needs a digital identity and it should be a trusted one. And to go back to the German context, um, this was alluded to within the presentation, it was really a great effort. Um, a lot of federated identity services or centralized identity options were brought in as well as a concept. Um, but in the end, um, the German government, as well as uh, the European one, as we're seeing with the IDAS2, are really going for the modular wallet setup and are going for a self-sovereign approach. And this was really what um, has created a lot of excitement within the SSI community. And Yolocom is in there, um, also within the so-called Begleitforschung, which is basically um, a science track, um, independent research uh, consortium, which is following along with all the um, SDI consortia and trying to make sure that things are going well. And there we are working as well with interoperability working groups in order to make sure that we have no sealers, no login procedures, but really an interoperability profile where all the consortia can go in. And the outcome is, uh, and wrapping it with that, that within the next one year or two, these different areas that were shown in the presentation all across Germany will also, ha also have a lot of communities within them. And so the idea is that the citizens living in those communities can then make use of the pilot. Um, whether this be for university use cases, as was outlined by both Jonas and Irene, so similar use cases like this. Then we've got mobility use cases. So if it's for ride sharing using an e-scooter or a bike, or also showing um, your student ID and that you are authorized to use public transport in your area when you are a school kid, and as well as health sector um, options. There's a big variety, also um, small shop owners uh, using um, yeah, coupon areas for tourists or for local um, citizens. Yeah, I'm, I'm detracting into different use cases, but the idea is really to go with your first question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm also trying to um, trying to loop in Jonas Schneider here again from Misatus and representing the ID Union Consortium today. And I really would like to understand because ID Union is a consortium that is very, very vocal, very active, um, presenting their different use cases also on, on social media platforms, platforms, which I personally really like. And it shows that you have brought actors from, from a range of different industries together, right? So my my big question here, kind of staying with the topic, is how do you how do you try to harmonize, how do you balance different questions around governance frameworks or trust frameworks that are connected to credentials and actually establish you? or establish um, trust in the consortium between actors. So how do you actually approach this in, in your consortium? So we have a closed um, blockchain. So only um, members of the consortium are available to, to create credentials. So all of these companies are approved from the other consortium partners that they are allowed to, to um, to provide credentials and the issuing process. So that's that's our um, our solution for that problem. Okay, thank you very much. So understanding that you you currently try to achieve this by by running everything via one network and, and kind of controlling access to the network. Um, when we go back to the question of interoperating on a on a broader level, so actually kind of trying to connect with the with the EPSI network on the European level, potentially, you have the same situation again, right? You have a coherent governance in the context of EPSI, and then we have other networks here in Germany, for example, there's a mentionable one with Gaf Digital that can offer a similar setup, right? So it's known actors, but how, and also this question really goes out to all of the people involved in the call, because I think now we can kind of tie the conversation together a bit, is how do we make sure that across different networks that all kind of solve the, the governance and the trust questions internally, how can we achieve that across networks? Okay, if I may add here, can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so in my opinion, we have to work step by step. Um, okay, talking now having the hat of FC, 
First, we have to achieve the governance and the, the trust in the different nodes that are part of blockchain, of our blockchain in Epsi. I mean, establish clearly which is the security of the nodes that we can trust in every node, that we have the possibility, for example, to, um, to expel a node. So all this kind of security governance. And after that, I think we can start the track for trusting in other networks. So my answer here is first home, then Roma. Okay, thank you. Any any other person that wants to chip in on this question? I must say I can't see you at the moment, unfortunately, so you have to directly speak, please. I guess if I may add, Kai, yes, not to leave you <laughs> to with a question for pending. Um, it's a difficult question. I think that's why there is no direct answer. Uh, in order to achieve this uh, interoperability among different networks um, and communities and countries and regions, um, I, I, even within a specific, um, using the same framework within a specific region, that interoperability is super difficult to achieve um, because we have interoperability at many different layers, data models, communication protocols, governance models, trust models. Uh, and it's one of those levels. There are a lot of people working on that, sometimes overlapping in, in responsibilities. Uh, so many initiatives working on the same thing um, with different perspectives. So, uh, for instance, talking by experience, we've been involved in this initiative called the Verifier Universal interface and what we try to lead here is the definition of standard APIs so that any wallet can talk to any verifier component. Um, we identified six key um, APIs. We started working on three of them. We've been working for one full year on getting consensus between 12 organizations in those three very simple APIs. And we are halfway still. Um, so, inter and that's, I'm talking just about the technical perspective of the whole interoperability framework. So, I think we're in the right path. I think one of the good things of SSI is that everyone involved from the technology and the uh, policy perspective, we're all seeking that interoperability. We all have that common goal. We all want that. Um, so the, the, the interests are aligned. Um, I think there will have to be some kind of top-down approach. That's why I was talking in the chat about, okay, we need technical specifications. We need regions saying, this will have to be this way. Because if we try to get consensus between all the different vendors and countries and stuff, that consensus will be very, very difficult. It will take years, which is what happens with standards. It takes really years to achieve a standard, a mature standard. So uh, some top-down approach for some specific layers of interoperability is, is necessary, uh, at least to achieve that interoperability at a much slower pace, uh, sorry, faster um, pace. And then, uh, um, you know, uh, trying to get regions and communities talking to each other by enabling forums where these different organizations talk. Um, for instance, one, one great example um, is the conversations between Canada and the European Commission that they just published. Uh, those conversations early on are super important. Um, and these are happening. Yeah. Yes, I think expectations need to be realistic that this will not happen overnight. I can I can absolutely agree enough by hosting this group under the governmental advisory body on a regular basis and we're actually going to host a range of workshops with the Canadian European collaboration project in the coming year. So I can really just um, agree to kind of that early work and it's really is still very early work at this point. Um, but I think one thing that can be brought into this discussion, especially when we always think about okay how can we solve governance for the whole problem right like how, how can we solve governance or how can we like more specifically how can we solve trust frameworks for the industry uh, i think that is a bit of a misled approach in in too many ways because ultimately ultimately when you look at how this has been approached in the past and how it actually was quite successful in the past is when you look at it per credential right so when you actually really look at kind of trust of like trust into the credential on a credential basis. So you try to understand, okay, what's, what is it for a KYC proof? What is it for an EID? What is it for a digital signature? What is it for a student ID card? What is it for um, 
a, a kind of tourism credential that allows you to travel to certain donations, right? Like each of these have very different requirements that pose different requirements also on the level of networks that actually secure such an infrastructure and wrapping that all into one technical infrastructure or technical ecosystem is really kind of imposing a lot of regulatory compliance onto the whole ecosystem while maybe this particular level of security or level of compliance is only required for one or two of the credentials involved so at inapa when we're discussing this more recently we've often spoken about more of a kind of credential based approach to trust frameworks because really the current reality of lawmaking around trust in particular industries is also focusing on that um but yeah since we're we're having only a few minutes left for our our discussion i would like to leave this topic now if you if you agree and i would like to go again into a bit of more the kind of blockchain in use topic of today's talk right so how do we and where do we see adoption so my, my big question to you guys would be since we're all here right we're all currently funded under government contracts it seems at least partly um all the businesses that presented today are involved in government projects we're involved in projects with european or national level institutions we have public sector um, and private sector customers very likely at least for for the company i'm working on usually i can i can say that, that there's a lot of private sector involvement as well but my big question here also for i think representing a bit the audience um which is quite more diverse than just a public sector probably is like where's the, really the adoption going to happen where do you think ssi will first be properly adopted with production systems maybe jonas if you want to go first Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, can you repeat the question? Or yeah, so so my question was: in which market or in which area will will we see a first production environment and first production use of SSI? So is it going to be B two B? Is it going to be education? Is it going to be e government? Is it going to be booking your dental appointment? Uh, what is it like? Where do you think its real first first real world use case uh, will appear? Oh, I think that's a, <laughs> a tough question. I think it's all of that because um, in, in, in ID Union, for example, we have some, some pilots in all of these areas, areas and all of them are very, um, yeah, can, can have very much po potential in the, in the future. So um, it's very hard to say which of them will be the, <clears throat> the first or the, the one which will be the leading one. So I think all of them. Um, and we will see. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you so much. I think um, there's a few that are a bit harder to achieve from a regulatory standpoint, while others are a bit less tight on, on the regulatory compliance angle of them. Um, but maybe Irene or Irene have <laughs> another point on this. Um, I would concur with Jonas. This is really um, a little bit like rolling dice and looking into uh, the glass ball into the future. But I would say that you have just basically given uh, the prime example, the level of assurance is an issue. So how much regulatory hurdles do, does a company have to cover in order to make the use case happen? And at the same time, I would say it has a lot to do with the regionality, perhaps. So if we have, for example, Gataka, which is paving the way for SSI in Spain, and they are focusing on education, then I'm just assuming that education is going to be one of the first proper everyday occurrence SSI use cases within Spain. While we've seen with the different uh, SS, uh, SDI projects within Germany, it can be that in Saxony, it's also an education use case, uh, while in um, Bavaria and Hesse, it's going to be mobility because um, a very good regional provider for mobility services says, hey, I'm part of this consortium. I'm offering my customers the option to go with the SSI tech stack and people just adopt it because it's easy, it's quick, it's well marketed. and so so within Germany, you would see different regions adopting different use cases at a different speed, depending on how well it's provided. So I think we can all concur or have examples in our head from memory where really the adoption has a lot to do with usability and a good timing within a market. So I would say um, all the use cases at the same time, just for different sizes of the market and different regions. 
Yeah, thank you so much. I think that is really also adding to the point. I just see that Susanne Orlovsky, Susanne Gut Orlovsky from Sferity, that was originally also planned for this event today, um, has messaged us in the chat that company identity will come first and is already in production. And I think that is a really important point, uh, something that I also had on my mind as a, a area of development that is probably underestimated by quite a few people is the B2B sector and the engagement from company to company, because here um, a few major players have actually developed systems to utilize SSI-based technology for identification of organizations and also identification of products and also machine uh, machines and other particular technical environments that can be, yeah, ultimately improved or whose whose use can be improved by uh, making them available and making them manageable with decentralized identity. So thank you for adding that point, Susanne, and sorry for you um, that you can't be here. This is really a sad technical issue for our call today. Um, yeah, let me let me kind of go for a last round with all of you here on the panel. Um, I would like to hear from you, what is your kind of next big wish for the community, especially when we look at this kind of overarching topic for today? What do you think has to happen next? What should we focus on as an industry? What should people interested in the topic as the ones here today in the audience um, actually work on, focus on in order to, to bring this to life? And we'll start with Irene Hernandez. Sorry, I was a minute. So what will it take us to bring this to life? So, so the question is, what is, what is the thing you think is required to bring this to life? What is the next thing we need to tackle? Not everything, yeah. what is the next thing? What can we practically do next? So practically for me, uh, literally is working on a technical plus policy framework uh, and making that accepted, like li literally published. That's the thing that will trigger all these pilots to become real production use cases. I think all our efforts should really focus on getting those FC specs and SF specs published uh, and available to everyone. The DCI DAS version 2.0 approved. This is for me the most important step to really make this um, happen. Interoperability will come with time. Um, it, it's a necessary step, but not, not the first one um, in my opinion. All right, thank you so much. And Jose Manuel, what do you think? Okay, so in my wish list for next year, uh, okay, soon our Christmas, so we have we have time to write our wish list. Um, I will point out the engagement of member states, because for example, now um, in our early adopters initiative, we are issuing verifiable ID credential, we are issuing diploma credentials. Uh, for example, we can provide a service to revoke these credentials, but we need the um, engagement of member states and the business and the stakeholders, for example, to say if we can really revoke a credential, for example, in Spain, maybe we can revoke a credential or diploma because the Spanish legislation allows us to do that. But for example, in Italy, the revocation of a diploma credential is not allowed because it's illegal. So we need... This, this approach and this input from member states regarding, for example, the verifiable ID credential. Can we revoke an, a credential of identity? What is the meaning of that? We remove your identity. You are not more a Spanish citizen, for example. So it has a lot of connotation. For example, in Spain, now with this, we have a physical ID cards with two digital certificates on it. We can revoke the digital certificate, but we can't revoke the card. So talking the verifiable ID, which will be the approach, like a digital certificate or like the physical ID card. So we need these business inputs from member states to go into production. Thank you very much for such a such a clear insight and something that is really on, on your hands right now, it seems. Uh, let's go next with Irene Damsky. Thank you. Um, since your first phrasing of the question was, what is our wish, I would say good timing, because at the moment we are seeing that what is needed is going to be a technical standardization, at least something that people can actually focus on, and especially an interoperability standardization so that we can just progress together and uh, stay away from silos. At the same time, it was mentioned uh, often enough, we need a proper regulation to take some of the hurdles away to make the technology actually hit ground. 
And uh, in the third instance, also proper marketing, not in the sense of advertising, but in the sense of education, uh, education for both business owners and companies, as well as end users and citizens to not make this something they are scared of, not something that confuses them, but something that makes it easy to understand, easy for them to say yes to adoption. And um, if we have bad timing, then basically the tech doesn't work when companies need it and citizens hear about a data leak or about regulation issues and say, ah, this is also complicated, let's not do it. And if we have great timing and I get uh, the Christmas wish that Jose has just pointed out, then everything would happen in the perfect order of standardization happens, regulation falls in line, business owners can approach this and then there's a lot of very good uh, adoption headlines and publicity and people say, oh, this seems to be working, this seems to be manageable, it's easy to do, let's adopt this. All right, uh, positive outlook from you and then we go last with Jonas Schneider. Yeah, um, as already said, regulations are very important, but I think inter interoperability is important topic too, um, but it's very difficult to manage, uh, as already said, but we need to implement it because, for example, no one wants a separate wallet for each use case, so I think it's very important for the user experience. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I think um, linking linking this back to the German Lighthouse projects. Luckily, we have an interoperability task force there. I'm uh, lucky to lead that one. <laughs> so happy to see you there. And this allows me to say thank you very much for my panelists and for your presentations today. I want to hand it over to Stefania actually for the official goodbye. And thank you for your time. Thank you all for this insightful panel. And um, um, I also know that a few of our attendees actually would like to have your presentations if, if possible and if you agree. Um, so in case, just feel free to send it at stefania at birdchain.com. And I will also uh, forward those presentations to our attendees via that email. So also if you are an attendee and you wish to have one of the presentations please write to stefania at birdchain.com. And tomorrow we continue actually um, our blockchain news conference with the DeFi session. And I'd like also to share with you um, the, um, the link uh, here in the chat if you want to subscribe. And this episode has been recorded, so you can actually find it in our um, YouTube channel. Uh, this is specifically this one. And I'm going to paste also this link here. And I wanted to thank you, uh, everyone, like Irene, Stefan, Kai, uh, Jose, uh, Irene Hernandez, uh, Jonas Schneider, and for this uh, beautiful first episode. And um, thank you for all the attendees for having engaged and your interest. And um, I'll see you tomorrow with the DeFi session. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Ciao. Thank you. Bye.